Be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am God. Well, hello and a very good morning to each and every one of you. Good morning. Well, it's lovely to see you all here this morning, although it's a little bit colder than I think we would like it to be. Uh, I thought spring was coming, but uh, <laughs> it's always been, de been delayed by a couple of days. Um, but not to worry. Uh, we shall not be out this afternoon anyway, because obviously we shall be watching the Scotland game, won't we? <laughs> Watch, watching Scotland beat, beat France in Paris. Now... Maybe yes, maybe no, but we, we, we live in hope. But uh, yes, yeah, not so bad. But that should be a good game. That should, should well be worth watching. Um, just a couple of things on the order of service that I want to draw your attention to. Uh, the Kirk session, of course, meets on Wednesday the 1st of March at 7 o'clock in the Lesser Hall. And uh, I'd ask elders, please be there uh, on, on Wednesday. And the World Day of Prayer service is on Friday the 3rd of March at 2 o'clock in Buckhaven Baptist Church. So if you put that, all, put that in, your, in your diaries, please. Friday the 3rd of March at 2 o'clock in Buckhaven Baptist Church for the World Day of Prayer Service. That's quite important. And of course, uh, at the back of sheet, on the back page of your order of service, you'll notice again there will be a retiring offering today for the Turkey syria earthquake appeal. And uh, our thoughts are with all the people who are struggling uh, with things there. I've also got a, a note from the Guild. Uh, the Guild, Guild Drive uh, is on, on Wednesday, the 17th of May, and they have spaces available. Uh, and the cost is £25, leaving at 11.30 a.m. and uh, at high tea at the Victoria Hotel in Kirkcaldy. So if anyone is interested, please see Anne Castles or Elizabeth Kirk. That's uh, the Guild Drive, Wednesday, the 17th of May, and there are spaces available for that. I went on one of these once, and uh, the behaviour of the guild was absolutely appalling. Eh? I know. I, I, was, I had to hide on the way back because I thought, no, no, I can't be seen with these people again. <laughs> no, that's not true. Of course it's not. <laughs> you know, one of these days, there are two men in white coats are going to come through that door and take me away. <laughs> but until then... Until then, until then, we come together as one family. We come together as God's people. We come to be with him, to be with each other, to feel at peace with him, to feel at peace with each other. And today on the first Sunday of Lent, as we come and start making our way towards the Easter Sunday and all that means, we're going to reflect upon what it means to share our story of faith and how we can do that in a very simple, direct way. So let's begin by singing together hymn number 461, the hymn, How Sweet the Name of Jesus Sounds, 461.
I've just realized it was uh, very remiss of me uh, not to welcome Blair to our church this morning. And Blair is playing the organ for us, and he'll be with us in the, for the next couple of weeks. And so uh, we're just delighted to have him here with us today. So let's now simply unite together as one family and come before God in prayer. Let us pray. O almighty and merciful God, you are always ready to hear us. You are always there for us. You wait for us to come to you in prayer. And when we do that, you give us more than either we desire or deserve. And so we ask today that you look down upon us and help each one of us to feel your mercy as we bring before you in this moment of silence all the things that we, we know we have done wrong in the past week. We remember, Father, the words we have said which have caused hurt to others. We remember, O oh Lord, the things that we have done that have caused pain to others. And we remember the things we have left undone that we know we should have done. And, O oh God, we remember times when we have walked by on the other side. O oh, almighty and everlasting God, you love all that you have made and forgive the sins of all those who look to you. Create in each one of us then a pure heart that we may gladly receive mercy from you as we lament all that we have done that has diminished your love in the world. Forgive us through Jesus Christ, the perfect one, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one perfect community of love, now and always. O oh Lord our God, we just ask this in the name of your Son, who taught us when we come together as one family to say together the words of that family prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. We take our reading this morning from the New Testament of our part of our Pew Bible, Acts 26, verses 1 to 23. And you'll find that on page 143 of the Pew Bible. And I'll ask Margaret to read that for us this morning. Acts 26, verses 1 to 23. Hear the word of God. Agrippa said to Paul, you have permission to speak for yourself. Then Paul stretched out his hand and began to defend himself. I consider myself fortunate that is before you, King Agrippa. I am to make my defence today against all the accusations of the Jews. Because you're spe especially familiar with all the customs and the controversies of the Jews, therefore I beg you to listen to me patiently. All the Jews know my way of life from my youth, a life spent from beginning among my own people and in Jerusalem. They have known me for a long time if they are willing to testify that I have belonged to the strictest sect of our religion and lived as a Pharisee. And now I stand here on trial on account of my hope in the promise made by God to our ancestors, a promise that our 12 tribes hope to attain. As they earnestly worship day and night, it is for this hope, Your Excellency, 
that I am accused by Jews. Why is it, though, incredible by any of you that God raises the dead? Indeed, I myself was convinced that I ought to do many things against the name of Jesus in Nazareth. And that is what I did in Jerusalem with authority relieved from the chief priests. I not only locked up many of the saints in prison, but I also cast my vote against them when they were condemned to death. If I punish them often in all the synagogues, I, tr I tried to force them to blaspheme, and since I was so furious and raged at them, I pursued them even to foreign cities. With this in mind, I was traveling to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priests. When at midday along the road, Your Excellency, I saw a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, shining around me and my companions. When we had fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It hurts you to kick against the goals. I asked, Who are you, Lord? The Lord answered, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. But get up and stand on your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to appoint you to serve and testify to the things in which you have seen me and to those in which I will appear to you. I will reassure you from your people and from your Gentiles, to whom I am sending you, to open their eyes so that they may return from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, so that they may receive forgiveness of sins and place among those who are sacrificed by faith in me. After that, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, but declared first to those in Damascus, then to Jerusalem, and throughout the countryside of Judea, and also to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God and do deeds consistent with repentance. For this reason, the Jews seized me in the temple and tried to kill me. To this day, I have had help from God and so I stand here testifying to both small and great, saying nothing but what the prophets and Moses said would take place, that Messiah must suffer, and that by being the first to rise from the dead, he would proclaim light both to our people and to our Gentiles. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Margaret. Thank you. We sing together now hymn number, hymn number 540, I Heard the Voice of Jesus Say, 540.
you know, each one of us, if we are genuine followers of Jesus, have an important story to tell. Now, it's not just those with dramatic details like Paul, but all of us with ordinary stories of life change can have a, a dramatic effect on those that we talk to. As Chuck Wendell said in his book, Come Before Winter, he said, the skeptic may deny your doctrine or attack your church, but he cannot, cannot honestly ignore the fact that your life has been changed. So we're going to have a look at this Acts 26. And, and, it, and there is an example of how God used one man's story. In this passage, of course, Paul is in prison for his faith. And he's been given the opportunity to speak in his own defense before King Agrippa. And he tells his story in a clear and powerful way. One that, that we can learn from. Paul was obviously very effective in his communications here. And in that way, he left some clues for all of us to benefit from. So we're going to look at some principles. Principles that we can learn from Paul in order to be more ready and more able to share our own stories whenever the opportunities arise. And I'm not talking about going, knocking on people's doors and lambasting people or pressuring people. I'm just talking about whenever the opportunities arise. So the first thing he does, he starts with the other person. Look back at verses 2 and 3. And you'll see that he actually focuses attention and opening words directly on his listener, King Agrippa. More than just being polite or introducing a topic that he wanted to talk about, he was very careful to establish the areas of common ground that they had with each other on an ordinary human level. They were Jewish, well-educated, aware of the details and nuances of the Jewish faith. And Paul spoke to him with great respect, even if he didn't respect his values or lifestyle. Paul was, in effect, establishing a rapport. A rapport which earned him the right to ask at the end of verse 3 that the king patiently listened to what he had to say. So when we're telling our stories, the first rule is put the other person first. Establish that rapport. The second is talk with confidence and clarity. Just think about the situation Paul was in. Now, Paul was a prisoner, and he was actually brought into the room to see the king bearing, wearing heavy chains, seemingly at a huge psychological disadvantage in this interchange. And yet he talked about being fortunate to be speaking to the king. He laid, laid out his facts clearly and concisely. So where did Paul get such poise and confidence when the odds were massively stacked against him. First of all, he knew who God was. Paul had long since learned about and experienced the truth about God and Jesus. He had looked into all the claims and evidence and talked personally to some of the people that Jesus had walked with. Secondly, he knew who he was. He knew that he was a favoured son of the King of Kings. So he wasn't going to let a mere human king intimidate him. Knowing the truth about God and about himself gave Paul courage and strength, even in the most difficult circumstances. And guess what? The same can be true for all of us. The third thing is, organize your story chronologi chronologically. You may have noticed that Paul didn't ramble around in a, a random fashion when he told the king his story. 
What he did was clearly and concisely relay his experience in the order it actually happened. Look at verse 4, where he talks about his experience growing up before knowing Christ. He said, the Jews all know the way I lived. They know me. They've known me ever since I was a child, from the beginning of my life in my own country and also in Jerusalem. And he continued in that vein through to verse 11, talking about the, the harm and the damage he'd done. So we refer, that, we refer to that as the B.C., or before Christ, part of his story. But then in verse 12, he shifts into talking about his encounter with Jesus on the road to Damascus. And he elaborates on that experience through to verse 18. That's the middle part of his story, which we'll refer to as MC, meaning met Christ. Then in verse 19, he goes on to the AC part of his story, which is what happened after he met Christ. He says, so then, king, I, I was not disobedient to the vision from heaven. And he goes on from there. The point is, you have, if you're a committed Christian, a committed follower of Christ, a BC, MC, and AC story, and that story can have a, a huge impact on the people around you. Even if it might just seem kind of bland and unexciting to you. If knowing Jesus has changed your life, then people out there need to hear it. In your order of service today, you received this piece of paper to help you put together your BC, MC, and AC story. It's very simple. It's not rocket science. It's not difficult. You just take it home, and in the BC column, write something down about what your life was like before you came to know Christ. What kind of person were you? What did you do? Now, it may be that you grew up in a family where the Bible was taught and you, you can't remember ever not believing in God. Well, put that down. It's part of your story. However, if you came to faith later in life, write down what happened to you, how you experience it. In the MC column, Write down what it was that made you receive Christ in your life. Now I know, for many of us, that would be a, a difficult thing to put your finger on. Then put that down. For you, it may have been a, a gradual dawning, a gradual realization that Christ died for your sins. And although you hadn't particularly led a wild life, you know that you'd done things that needed forgiving. That's a perfectly legitimate thing to put down. However, if there was something that happened to you personally, and you felt the presence of God in your life at, at one particular time, put that down. People need to hear it. And finally, there's the AC column. Here simply, put what life is like for you now that you have discovered Jesus. In other words, what difference has he made to your life? How have you changed as an individual? What do you do now that you didn't do before? How do you feel now that you didn't feel before? What was your purpose in life now when you didn't have a purpose in life before. These things matter a lot. 
And there you have your story, ready to share with other people when the opportunity arises. You know, we live in a culture that relates best to stories. People want to know, not just if Christianity is true, but whether it works. And your story powerfully illustrates that God is alive in your life and makes a marked difference in how you think, what you value, how you live. Never, ever forget that our stories are crucial. And now, you can tell your story in the same way that Paul did. And with a confidence of knowing that it's our best argument, it's the best reason we could possibly give for why others should follow Christ. Amen. We sing together now hymn number 248, For My Sake and the Gospels Go. Hymn number 248. And now we simply unite before God in prayer. O oh, gracious Lord, when we remember and look at the ways in which you continue to break in upon our lives, showering us with gifts and wonder, we are reminded how we, in our living, should emulate that same generosity. Remind us that the best giving is cheerful and that the unclenched hand is more fitting to sharing. Accept then what we offer our time, our talents, and our money, and all that we have and are, so that this world, our world, your world, need not be gripped by fear or want, or lack of shelter, or lack of friends. This we ask through that same Jesus Christ, our Lord and Saviour. Amen.
And now we simply unite before God with our prayers for others. Let us pray. O holy God, as we begin our Lenten journey, mindful of the temptation and suffering that your, your son Jesus Christ endured in the wilderness, we ask for you to strengthen us as we find ourselves in the desert of human faults, failings, and sinfulness. Creator God, your, your love reaches out to the boundaries of our world, to the rich who have everything they need, and the poor who have nothing except misery and oppression. And so we pray for all your people, whoever they are, wherever they live, and whatever their circumstances, that in their joy and their sorrow, the knowledge of your presence might bring comfort, healing, and restoration. And so, Father God, we pray against all areas of our society where good food is wasted or disposed of unnecessarily when it could be used to relieve suffering. We thank you for the work of food banks and charities which support disadvantaged individuals and communities. But, O oh, loving God, we pray for all of those dear to our own hearts who are ill or in any kind of need. We also give thanks for those on the road to recovery following illness, surgery, or procedures, and for those whose only healing will come through death. O oh, everlasting God, your love and forgiveness washes over us and astonishes us with gen generosity. So may we go out from this time of worship today as people who enjoy complete forgiveness and a restored relationship with you and all those with whom we share our lives. But, O oh Father, today we pray for the land and the people of Ukraine as they confront foreign aggression and invasion. Open, open the eyes of those who have been overtaken by a spirit of deception and violence, that they be horrified by their works. Grant victory over the powers of evil and bless your, Ukraine with your gifts of liberty, peace, tranquility, and good fortune. We remember especially before you the mothers and the fathers, the innocent children, widows and orphans, the disabled and helpless, those seeking shelter and refuge, who reach out to you and to their fellow human beings, looking for mercy and compassion. But, Father, we pray also for the people of Turkey and Syria as they continue to struggle with the effects of the earthquake in that area. We ask again that the world community should respond in a quick and effective manner, bringing aid to those who so desperately need it. Encourage and strengthen all those who work to bring relief to those in need. And may your love and strength be felt by all those who have lost so much in this disaster. O oh Lord our God, we just bring before you all our concerns, our anxieties, and our worries. Our worries for this world and the people in it. Our concerns for our community and our church. Our anxieties and our families Father, we bring them to you and lay them at your feet in the sure and certain knowledge that the past, the present, and the future are safe with you. This we do in the name and by the grace of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. We close our service then by singing the last hymn, 458, At the Name of Jesus, Every Knee Shall Bow. Unfortunately, we won't be singing the Loman Benediction this morning because we've, we've misplaced the music. I know, you can't get the staff, can you? <laughs> Never mind. It'll be there next week. So, At the Name of Jesus.
And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you, here now and forevermore.